Tough Topics with Trisha. Discussing issues important to the KU community. And now, your host, Trisha. My name is Trisha. We're at Top, Tough Topics. Um, it is October, and October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and so today I felt like it would be really suitable and fitting to talk about domestic violence and talk about domestic homicide as well, because that is something that I don't think is mentioned or really you know, discussed very often. Um, and I have someone with me today that is very knowledgeable about all these topics and is a fantastic person. Her name is Stacy, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hello, my name is Stacey Jordan, and I'm actually the campus advocate and paralegal for Kutztown University and um, other colleges in Berks County. Um, I am employed by Safe Berks, which is the agency in Berks County that supports victims and survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, and sexual assault. Thanks so much for having me, Trisha. Yeah, of course. I love working with you. Uh, the work that you do is really important for both the Women's Center and just, just in general as well, for even at Safe Berks as well. Um, so while everyone's probably really excited that it's finally October and that fall is, you know, finally starting to set in, it is also a kind of sad time because we are kind of remembering that there's some really not good relationships that are happening among people. Um, so to always, I always like to start with kind of talking about why it's important that we talk about these tough topics and why is it important that we talk about domestic violence. Well, um, I can share that at Safe Berks, uh, just last year, we served over 4,000 clients um, in Berks County. So it certainly is happening and it's happening to a lot of people. Um, so I definitely think that uh, talking about this topic brings awareness. Uh, it also helps those who are experiencing violence in their, in their households or in their personal lives to not feel alone. Um, there is support out there and there are people that are able to help um, with these difficult situations. Yeah. Roughly how many people are facing violence in their relationships? So there's basically it says, um, I pulled up some statistics just to kind of give you some information about that. Um, one in three women and one in four men have experienced um, some form of physical violence. So those are some pretty staggering numbers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I hear statistics like that, I always try to picture, like, if I was in a room with somebody, I always kind of picture, like, pointing out, like, one out of three of everyone or one out of four. Um, I think that sometimes we forget that these topics exist if they're not happening to us or sometimes we don't realize that they're happening and that we're not really aware of what to look for in these um, unhealthy relationships. And so I kind of want to also talk about maybe, maybe we can start with the history of it and like how this really came about. And then we can maybe talk about, you know, what do you actually look for? Like, how do you know if you're in an abusive relationship or if you're in an unhealthy relationship at that? Um, I don't think, so when I was going through the training at Safe Breaks, I realized I guess I didn't realize at the time the big history that domestic violence has had and that like at one point it was literally legal for uh, men to beat their wives and so I was doing some research today about that and it was I found that there was codes and religious doctrine that would commonly contain allowances for physical punishment of women by their husbands, as well as legal protection from consequences for their actions if the punishment occurred within a prescribed range of severity. So there is, there's this, um, this concept, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about it. It's called uh, the rule of thumb. And what does that look like? Yeah, so my understanding with the rule of thumb, that, you know, people use that phrase all the time. You hear it all the time. Well. Now, when you hear it, after listening to this, you'll probably stop and think about it. It literally was, um, you were able to, you know, abuse your wife and children as long as the bruises were within the proper measurements on the ruler. So rule of thumb, it, it wasn't able to be larger than your thumb. So that's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, it's wild that like at one point... They're like, okay, like you can do that, but like, just make sure it's like not, 
bigger than your thumb. Like that's a good measurement to use. Right. But maybe, you know, it's, it's fine that that's happening. You know, it's okay. Yeah. Right. Um, it's wild to me. I didn't realize that. I mean, I knew that domestic violence had a history. Like I knew that it had been around for a while. Um, but it was literally that the laws allowed for it to happen. And that only, well, starting in 1871, the U S began to see acknowledgement of domestic violence as a crime when Alabama rescinded rights of men to assault their wives. Hard to believe that's Alabama, right? Right. That was the right. first. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you, you would think you would see it in a little bit more of progressive the areas. progressive areas mm-hmm. like New York. Um, and then Massachusetts followed in, ni- in 1871 and then North Carolina in 1874. Um, and Maryland, though, was the first state to not only declare beating your wife illegal, but to prescribe legal consequences, consequences, um, you know, physical punishment or being jailed for a year, which I mean, in the, I guess back then being jailed for a year is like a big deal. But if that was the case, this like now I feel like being jailed for a year is like nothing for the amount of damage that someone can do in that sense. So it's just wild. And because we take a deeper look at it now too we realize that oh so it's not just the bruises that's not the only thing that's affecting you or the broken bone we go deeper now understand that it you know is emotionally hurting someone as well and they have many residual um, effects from that abuse yeah so you know these laws were put in place to protect someone from the actual physical abuse but now we know there's so much more to that yeah there definitely is Interestingly, though, I feel like when I talk about this stuff with my, you know, my workshops that I give, most people are not really aware of the other types of abuse and or don't realize that abuse doesn't have to be physical. And I feel like as a society, too, we're still kind of struggling to um, even get to a place of recognizing that you know, PTSD and trauma is a real thing that can happen, even if there was no physical abuse that happened within the relationship. Yeah, we want to see, we want to see bruises. We want to see broken bones. Did it really happen if you don't have any um, marks on your body? Um, So yeah, I think that that is true too. And like you said, I mean, that even goes hand in hand with the, the mental health piece, the stigma that's attached to that. Well, you look fine. So what's really the matter, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's the standard that we've kind of set somehow, like uh, implicitly that if you're not being beaten, that you're not being, that you're not in an an abusive or an unhealthy relationship. And I think that can be why students and just, you know, younger individuals have a hard time with recognizing when an abusive relationship is forming. Um, Because the one thing I always say to people, and I hope that they get what I mean People don't fall in love with an abuser. They fall in love with the person that they were before the abusive behavior started. And I think that's something that we don't remember a lot of times when we have these conversations because people are always like, why they stay? They're not a good person, blah, blah, blah. They'll go on and kind of more or less blame the victim in that situation. Right. Right. But I think this would be a good time to um, talk about how to even recognize that you're in an abusive relationship because sometimes when you're being told those messages of, well, I'm doing this because I love you, it gets really messy and it's really easy to like kind of, you know, just forget what you actually deserve. Um, And I think so many people are coming from so many varying backgrounds. So you either have experience or you've watched other relationships or maybe you're getting most of your um, information off of the movies or television or social media. Um, So we're all coming to into relationships from different spots and different places. Um, So we may be more vulnerable to accept undeserving attention and treatment. Um, and we're not even realizing it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think also that um, I totally just lost my thought that I had just now, which is, you know, it's fine. Um, what do you think is a sign that like people, what what sign do you think people really often overlook in an unhealthy relationship? Uh, I think that one thing that I see most often with the explosion of social media and the text messaging is just that constant need to know where you are, what you're doing, who you're with. 
Um, some of that's healthy if it's, you know, hey, this is where I'm at, just so you know, um, or, and don't worry. But then, you know, it turns into a really controlling behavior where people are also providing passwords so that their significant other can read every message that's sent back and forth and look through someone's phone. Um, and it starts out, as you said, sometimes is, oh my gosh, look how much they love me. They want to know where I am and what I'm doing and who I'm with. And they're jealous and that's so um, flattering. Um, but it's very quickly becomes abusive. So I think that's something that I definitely notice with people all different ages as well. This is not just college students. This is across the gamut. Um, and it's also something that I feel just continues to grow as people become more and more dependent upon their electronic devices. Yeah. I had a really good conversation in the workshop that I just gave this past week about digital abuse um, and how there is a line that you can cross where it becomes unhealthy to have access to your partner's phone. And someone, a student had made a really good point about, you know, we, we were having a conversation about, well, is it healthy to have passwords to your, to your partner's phone or, you know, to, to be looking at their social media. And like most of the students were like, no. Cause like, if you need, to, if you feel this need to go through someone's phone, then like, that's probably an, you know, an indication that there's a bigger issue there. Um, but the student kind of was on that other side of like thinking that it was kind of something that was okay. And um, it was a great conversation because I was able to help them understand that if someone is ex expecting and demanding your passcodes and your passwords to your social media, most likely it is crossing into that unhealthy boundary of, you know, just not trusting you. And things like that. And I, and I talked about like the healthy version too, because it is important to recognize that, you know, not all of this stuff is going to be unhealthy. Um, you know, my partner has my passwords because, well, he doesn't necessarily have my passwords to like my social media, but he has access to my phone because of if we're driving in the car and someone texts me and I want them to, I want to respond right away. Or if he wants to change the song, um, if we're listening to my music, I think that's perfectly fine and you know I have to trust that he's not going through my phone when we're when I'm not looking or things like that and I I just want to jump in and say I think that every couple can set healthy boundaries yeah that's a healthy boundary for your relationship right so um sharing your passwords I'm not saying it is unhealthy it's all in the boundaries that are set and how people respect them and not respect them and you touched on a very important thing I share them for these reasons. I am going to expect that you don't cross those boundaries and check when I'm not with you. Right, right. right. It's definitely that expectation of not, of, well, not necessarily expectation, but, you know, that understanding that you have this relationship with someone and that they're supporting you and that they are listening to you and that, you know, they want to be equal with you in these, in these certain things. Um, the one sign that I feel like we should definitely talk about, and I unfortunately don't have any information with me about it today, uh, is gaslighting. I, at one point, was really confused about this term, but then as soon as I kind of got a handle on it, I started seeing it in a lot of ways. Not necessarily in my own relationships, but, you know, relationships that I see with other people. What is gaslighting and how do you, how, how do we recognize it easier? That's something I think if you have a better understanding on it, I'd love to hear it because I have my own, but to put them out there, yeah, right. I'd rather hear you explain it. Um, so from what I personally understand about gaslighting is that it is when it's almost like a sub, for me, it's like a sub form of manipulation where they will make you second guess your understanding of something or they'll make you question your decision making um i just did a quick google search for it and it says the actual definition is to manipulate so it is like a form of ma manipulation by psychological means into questioning their own sanity okay so it's kind of it can be those situations of like 
if you go out with your partner and you get kind of a little drunk with them and you get into a fight or, you know, something happens and the next day you approach them about it and they're like, well, that didn't, that didn't happen. They make them question their own like understanding or their own perception of things. But I think it's something that we don't talk often enough about, but it's such a huge thing. Like it has such powerful effects. Um, so another, an example of gaslighting would be withholding. And it's a technique where abusers feign a lack of understanding and refuses to listen and declines to share his emotions. Okay. Or the idea of, well, I'm not listening to this crap again. I'm not going to like deal with this anymore. And we all know that that goes on a lot because that's what an abuser wants you to second guess everything so that you're wondering, you're not wondering why you're in this relationship, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it adds into that like overall like sense of manipulation sure. of, you know, just gaining more power and control over someone. So I've said the word manipulation a lot now. And so I feel like I should probably talk about that a little bit. Um, so manipulation is ultimately when a partner tries to influence your decisions, actions, or emotions, and it is not always easy to spot. Uh, but some examples can be convincing your partner to do things that you wouldn't normally feel comfortable with, and then ignoring you until they get their way, using gifts and or apologies to influence your decisions, um, or to get back in your own, in like your good graces. I feel like at the heart of most abusive behavior manipulation is always there it's the like flavor it's the tint of that i agree um and the one point that i've realized though is that you know manipulation is tricky because if you could just spot it right on you know at hand it wouldn't be manipulation anymore it right. wouldn't work ultimately. and you don't want to second guess people's best intentions either because yeah. you know we're kind of schooled on these topics so we're looking at people very closely and their actions and sometimes they're just being kind <laughs> yeah and you have to take that as base value and not be like oh well why are you bringing me a gift today what what are you trying to get out of this situation you know right yeah, yeah. it's easy to always like kind of you know be more um, analytic mm -hmm. about these situations but it also kind of goes hand in hand though with um Deflecting responsibility. I mean, if your partner is constantly saying, I'm so sorry, I was just too drunk last night, or I did this, or I'm really sorry, here's some flowers. They're possibly deflecting the responsibility of the damage that they're actually doing to your relationship. And um, it's, it's important to be able to pick up those, pick up those things. So deflecting responsibility is, like I said, going to be making the excuses for their behavior. Um, it can be literally them blaming you. Um, or other people or past experiences for their actions. It could be using alcohol or drugs as an excuse, using mental health issues or past experiences, like, like you know, if you cheated on someone um, or if you have divorced parents, people always like to pull that one out as a reason for their unhealthy behavior. Um, and I think that as soon as you can kind of spot someone deflecting their responsibility, it's easy to kind of, it's kind of easy to nip that one right, right at the end because that way... When you're like, wait, no, actually, you should just be sorry. Like, right. Insert yourself into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what other signs do you think are really important that we talk about? I think something that I see pretty often also is just a fast and furious beginning. Mm -hmm. um, a fast and furious, you know, it's... It, People get together and then they want to be together all the time. And then the next thing you know, like they're taking over time with that person's friends, maybe walking them to class and kind of just taking over life. Um, and sometimes, again, that's a flattering thing. If you've not been in many relationships or, you know, they're very good at manipulating it and making it just feel like they just want to be with you. Mm -hmm. um, so fast and furious is something just to kind of check yourself. It's okay to slow things down. Mm -hmm. And, and if it's a healthy relationship, that's okay with the other person as well to kind of take it at your pace. Yeah. I, I have on here for the 10 signs of an unhealthy relationship and tensity is one of them. And I think that most time people 
people imagine that being like, you know, those intense moments with someone. But I think that what you just described is also intensity. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's not having that second to slow down your pace. And the, the pace is always set, you know, quicker and more intense And it's never really discussed with you about how you're feeling and how you're, if you're feeling comfortable with how much time you're spending with them and things like that. Um, It's, I think one of the trickiest things is that all of this stuff can be masked and just be told, well, I just really like you. Mm -hmm. I love you. This is why I'm doing that. And so I think it's important that we talk about the, the signs because if you don't know what you if you don't know what to look for you right. don't know what you don't know ultimately so right um i think another one that we don't talk often enough about either is volatility is those unpredictable unpredictable and overreactions that kind of make you feel like you need to walk on eggshells and i think that's the perfect example is that that feeling of walking on eggshells around your partner because you don't want to upset them or things like that i, I think that's a really important one yeah do you feel like that's the I feel like now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like that's the sign that starts to give someone a little bit of a sense that maybe this isn't okay. You'll have that gut trigger. Yeah. Yeah. So in addition to, you know, these signs, I've also felt like, you know, how do you, how do you have conversations? Like you and I are having a conversation about it, but these are conversations that you and I are always having. Right. Um, Because this is stuff that we're aware of, but you know, a lot of times I found that students get really caught up of, well, my friend's in an abusive relationship. And I don't know how to approach them. I don't know how to do that for them or like, you know, be there, or support them. Right. Um, in your experience, what is the best support option or way to support someone? I think um, first and foremost, just like any of us, come to the table with your friend with an open mind and no judgment. Um, We just want to really listen to where they are and what's going on with them if they're willing to share, Um, because obviously we know that's not always the case. But if you have a friend who's willing to open up, do your best to not tell them what to do and try not to judge the situation that they're in because honestly until you're in the situation um, you really don't know what it's like for them Um, so then after you've been able to do that and maybe um, got some information from them if there are resources I always tell students who are I mean I've had students come to me and say I think that my roommate is in an abusive relationship and I point blank asked and they denied it what, what can I do to help? Um, I just simply say, let them know there's a confidential resource on campus. And this confidential resource is me. Um, and uh, someone can come and talk to me and it will not leave the room. Uh, and they said, well, how do I even give them your number? Sometimes you just slip a business card on their dresser and you just kind of leave it there. And when you're ready, there's help. Um, that's one way. You have other resources on campus. I'll kind of let you talk about that. Yeah. Um, in terms of other resources, the Women's Center is a place that someone can come and kind of, you know, talk out those situations with. I have a whole, like, sheet slash paper resource that, you know, kind of guides you through on kind of how to help a friend and, you know, how to, you know, really start that conversation. Like, one of the suggestions is to calmly start a conversation on a positive note. And to kind of just find a time to talk to your friend one-on-one in a private setting. And you can start by giving your friend positive affirmations and complimentary statements like, you're always so fun to be around. I've really missed you. And then once your friend kind of feels comfortable enough, Mm -hmm. you can start to begin voicing your concern for your friend. But then what's important is to kind of start focusing on the unhealthy behaviors. Uh, So the focus of the conversation really there should be that, uh, should be on the unhealthy on the unhealthy behaviors in, a, in the relationship and to provide your friend with a safe space to talk about it. Sometimes our instinct is to kind of just immediately label the relationship as abusive right? and to drive home the severity of the situation. But this instinct, however, can kind of cause your friend to retreat and shut down. So instead focusing on a specific behavior that you're seeing and how that behavior makes them feel. So for example, Saying something like, it seems like your partner wants to know where you are a lot and it's and is always texting and calling. How does that make you feel? 
kind of pinpoints that will help pinpoint the specific behavior and gets your friend to think about it and how you know it just kind of makes them feel in that situation and it doesn't it doesn't you're not giving her instructions of what she needs to do either you're mm-hmm. asking how she's feeling or he's feeling or they are feeling about that situation yeah the other point that I always like to kind of talk about too is to keep the conversation friendly but not preachy right and I think that's, that's so important yeah uh you know very few people in an abusive rela- relationships kind of recognize themselves as victims and it is likely that they do not want to be viewed that way so if you want to be helpful, it's it's really nice to make yourself emotionally accessible and available to your friend and try to make it feel like an equal exchange between two friends and not like a therapist and a patient or a crisis counselor and a victim situation. It's realizing that like in front of you, you have a human friend that just needs your support regardless. Um, and try not to be forceful with the conversation. It can be really hard for your friend to talk about their relationship, but remind them that they are not alone and that you just want to help. And um, the last one that I really want to pinpoint is that allow your friend to make their own decisions. So like you said, it's it's maybe just putting the business card on the dresser and just kind of, you know, throwing out there what you know about the situation and how to help. Uh, But also just ultimately recognizing that Telling them to just break up isn't going to necessarily always be the number one priority. And I, I just want to interject there. I mean, and it also may not be the safest option for your right. friend. Um, ending a relationship is going to be the time when that violence heightens and your friend really needs to be prepared for what that entails. They know that relationship best. I always say that as well. I don't know that your partner, you know them best and you're going to know what you need to do most likely to keep yourself safe or when the best time would be to end that relationship. Right. That's a great point. Um, Relationships, relationship abuse is very complex and your friend may be experiencing some form of trauma bonding or loyalty to the person who is abusing them. Because like I said, you don't fall in love with an abuser. You fall in love with the person that they were before the abusive behavior started. Um, And so your friend is also dealing with a, with a lot of controlling and manipulative manners and behaviors. And the last thing that they need is for you to kind of mimic those behaviors by forcefully telling them what to do. Um, It's hard. I mean, it's hard to just sit back and kind of watch someone go through something like that. But like you said, it's not always the safest option. And another resource that the women's center can provide is we can help you safety plan, or we can give you safety planning tips to then maybe refer back to your friend I have uh, a resource at the Women's Center actually from One Love Foundation that is tips on safety planning on how to do that. And that can just be as simple as, you know, maybe suggesting, you know, the grab bags. Make sure that they have a bag packed and ready to go if they do find themselves fleeing the situation. Um, You might have a code with your friend mm -hmm. um, to call, you know, if this word comes out, they know that you're in danger. Um, if you're in a dorm or in an apartment, maybe you're able to tell your neighbor if they see this color towel in your window. Um, yeah, there's many different things that people can do just to kind of have that plan in place. Maybe you'll never need it. Um, but if you do, it's in place. It's better safe than sorry, ultimately, because the other part that we'll talk about today is domestic homicide and how that's a real thing that does take place. Um, But before we get to there, I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, You are currently listening to Tough Topics with me, Trisha, and this is KUR. It's on us. To make sure that everyone knows that if a partner doesn't or can't consent to sex, it's sexual assault. It's on us to step up and say something. To not give our friends a pass. To always be on the side of the survivor. To realize we have a role to play in stopping sexual assault. It's on us, the Golden Bear community, to stop sexual assault. 
I took the pledge, and you should too, at itsonus.org. Brian Cranston for the Will Rogers Institute. There are lots of things in life that can take your breath away. Your first love, seeing the world. But life isn't the only thing that can take your breath away. Asthma is responsible for more sick days and ER visits than any other condition. For your free booklet, visit wrinstitute.org or call toll-free 877-957-7575 and find us on Facebook and Twitter. There are many good reasons to be left breathless. Help make sure asthma isn't one of them. The Will Rogers Institute, since 1936. Great party, huh, guys? Yeah, yeah, it is. So much fun. Uh I do say so myself. Um, Hey, did you know that birthday parties actually help build confidence in kids? Um, yeah, I did know that. Did you know that giving kids less sugar before bedtime helps them sleep better? Right, of course. Yeah, I knew that. Um, did you know that strollers have the right of way on sidewalks? <laughs> oh, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Did you know that friendly kids statistically have more friends? <laughs> Everyone knows that. Oh, yeah? yeah? It's pretty obvious. Yeah, yeah so yeah. obvious. Hey, guys, did you know that most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? I didn't know that. <clears throat> think I knew that. No, no, you didn't. Parents who really know it all? Know for sure that their child is in the right car seat at the right age and size. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. You're not wired to have a response to this sound. You're neutral to it. And you can hear it repeatedly without feeling anything. But when we introduce a new stimulus, save the food. We've achieved pulling a natural or inborn response from you. Save the food. Because 40% of all food in the U.S. never gets eaten. Save the food. Cook it, store it, share it. Just don't waste it. For tips and recipes, visit savethefood.com. Brought to you by NRDC and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Tough Topics. Um, I'm your host, Trisha, and today I have with me Stacy Jordan. She is our Safe Bricks campus advocate. Um, and just a little recap, we have been talking about domestic violence. We just kind of finished wrapping up talking about the 10 signs of an unhealthy relationship and kind of how to help a friend and a little bit of history. Um, and so now we're going to kind of move into more of some boundaries of why maybe, uh, or barriers, I'm sorry, not boundaries. Uh, barriers as to why someone might stay in an unhealthy relationship or stay in an abusive relationship. And we've kind of, we did talk about one before and it was that, you know, sometimes it's not always the safest option for someone to leave. Um, but there's also another, there's other things too, as to why someone can stay. Um, one of the biggest ones I think is just self blame. Like, you know, if you're being told every single day that you deserve what is happening to you, you're going to, you're going to believe that eventually, or, you know, you're going to, you're going to really buy into that. Um, Sometimes you have financial or economic, you're depending upon um, your partner for whatever reason, whether they're, you know, helping you pay rent or maybe you don't work at all. Um, People don't think about that, but if you don't, and oftentimes abusers also hold all the money, Mm -hmm. um, and they will restrict the amount of money given to, to the other person. So if you think about just walking out the door with what you've got on your back, that's a pretty tough thing to go through. Um, you know, and oftentimes, uh, a victim is isolated from family and friends. So they may not even feel as though they have that relationship that they can go to a family or friend and say, Hey, I really need some help. Or maybe they're really frightened for that other person's safety. I'm not going to my parents' house because my abuser is going to show up there Mm -hmm. and he could hurt someone or she could hurt someone. So, you know, there's lots of different reasons why people stay. Right. And I mean, if, if someone has a child or has kids, a lot of times abusers will also use kind of the kids as collateral in that in those situations and or abuse the children because mommy did xyz or sometimes they don't abuse the children but they can abuse the court system oh yeah so someone leaves with their children and you can you're still the other parent so they can still file for custody and 
you know, they can use that child, like you said, as collateral damage, basically. Yeah. It's unfortunate that there's all these barriers to leaving because it should just be as simple as, you know, saying, I don't deserve this anymore and I'm going to leave. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, And I realized that, you know, throughout the show, we've been kind of just saying she as the victim and, you know, he and we've kind of been talking about this in a very heterosexual way. Uh, But I do want to take a second to talk about the fact that, you know, this is stuff that also happens in the LGBTQ community. Um, They are almost at a high, they're actually at a higher rate of facing violence just for their own simple identity, which is really, really unfortunate. Um, I have some statistics with me today about that. Um, For bisexual individuals, their lifetime intimate partner violence, you're seeing about 37.3% of men experiencing this and 569 that's uh, for women, and that's that's really high. You know, 56% of women that identify as bisexual, that's over half of them. That's right. Um, and for gay and lesbian individuals, uh, for gay men, they're facing it at about 25%, and or, you know, 25% have faced it. And 40.4%, 40, 40. yeah, 40.4% of lesbians have experienced violence in their intimate partner relationships which is wild that i mean you're getting up to like that halfway mark right um and then transgender individuals also face violence really at a much higher of a rate uh although more limited in number studies suggest that transgender people may confront similar levels if not higher levels of intimate partner violence or IPV as compared to sexual minority men and women and cisgender people findings of lifetime IPV among transgender people from purposive studies range from 31.1% to 50%, which is wild. Um, And, you know, just like in any other relationship, there's going to be tactics of power and control. And I kind of just want to point some out, just to kind of be aware of this of you know maybe you weren't aware of how someone's going to possibly exert power and control over someone that identifies in the community but one of the biggest ones i think that we kind of overlook is outing a partner's sexual orientation orientation or gender identity a lot of times abusive partners in the lgbtq relationships will threaten to out victims to family members employers community members and other people um I want to remind everyone that that is that identifies as cisgender that it is never your decision to out someone. It is always someone, the person that identifies that way, that is their decision. And to take that away from them is just not okay. Um, and then there's another part of this is that saying that no one will help the victim because they are a lesbian or they're gay or they're bisexual or trans. Um, and for this reason, the partner kind of deserves the abuse. It's using that, that sense of using their identity against them ultimately to manipulate them and kind of justifying the abuse with the notion that the partner is not really lesbian or gay or bisexual. Actually, I feel like bisexual individuals face this a lot, uh, with, if they're dating a, a cis, gender male and it can be used against them that well you're not really bisexual because you're dating me right kind of deal so it's just really unfortunate and or monopolizing uh support resources through an abusive partner's manipulation of friends and family and support uh family supports and generating sympathy and trust in order to cut off these resources to the victim so it's kind of isolating yes and things like that Yes. Um, I found a little fun common myths about the LGBTQ domestic violence situation. Um, A myth is that domestic violence is mainly a straight issue and does not occur often in LGBTQ relationships. Not true. Just debunked that one. Um, Let's see what other myths we have. That incidents of domestic violence are less severe in LGBTQ relationships than when it happens in straight relationships. Confusing. Very confusing. Um, you know, they, the abuse that they experience, the, that the community can experience, can just be as equally or more damaging. 
Let's see. Oh, oh, this is a good one. Myth is that it is easier for LGBTQ victims to leave abusive relationships than it is for their straight and or married counterparts. And why is that? No, no reasoning. Literally no reasoning. <laughs> uh, the truth is actually that LGBTQ relationships are, are just as legitimate as straight relationships. Right. And regardless of gender identity, sexual, sexual orientation or marital status of two people in a relationship, leaving an abusive partner is often a difficult and painful process. Um, and just because you're in the community doesn't make that That's right. any, you know, doesn't diminish that pain. Or the um, love you have for the person. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. One hundred percent. So this is something that is straight up happening in the community, and it's really sad because no one talks about it. Um, so why don't we talk about something that we could do to remedy or to support someone? Um, one of the services I provide on campus is uh, legal options counseling. So when someone comes to me and has is experiencing some domestic violence, um, sometimes they're advised by a friend or a family member or administration, hey, why don't you consider filing a protection for abuse um, order? It's also sometimes referred to as a restraining order, but just to clarify, they're, they're not different. A restraining order is a protection from abuse order. Um, so just some basic information about it. Uh, for, for, to file, in order to file a petition for a protection from abuse order, um, you must have had an intimate relationship or partnership with the person you're filing against, or um, it would need to be a family member uh, by blood or by marriage. Um, it cannot be just someone that you live with in your household like your roommate, unless you were intimately at one time or another involved with that uh, roommate. So there is some... some confusion with that sometimes people think well no matter if, if I had some sort of relationship with the person I can file a protection from abuse petition and that that's just not the facts it doesn't meet the requirement of the of the law so I just wanted to throw that out there um, if you file a protection from abuse order that can be put into place for up to three years so that can you know provide you some long-term uh, protection it is a civil order so it's not a criminal action. Um, the only time that that crosses over is if the person that you're filing against um, would violate the order by contacting you, by harassing you, by committing another um, act of abuse against you. At that point, then, uh, there would be criminal charges filed against uh, the abuser. So that's just something that, again, People can come into my office, sit down, kind of give me a little bit about the situation going on, and we can talk about um, the actual process of filing it. It's not short and sweet. I will tell you that right from the get-go. Um, you do have to show up at court. Um, that whatever you write down in your petition will be served upon your abuser, so they will have every detail of your petition. They will see what you wrote. Um, after that, they also are given the opportunity to defend against this petition so you will have to testify in court unless they would agree to it um, so you know it's not people it's not as easy sometimes people say I'll oh, just go file a PFA like oh you know big deal it, it's uh, there's it's a lot more complex than that um, and time-consuming I would definitely say that that's again another barrier for someone's like leaving an abusive relationship yes if you don't have a car how are you supposed to get to the courthouse? Right. How are you supposed to even access the resources that you that you would need? Um, and if if you're if you're isolated enough and you don't have family support anymore because you've cut contact off with your family, not because you wanted to, but because your partner made that happen, or maybe you've left before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the average is someone leaves seven times prior to them actually staying out of that relationship, and unfortunately sometimes family and and friends they get tired of riding it with you and you know when you say i'm ready now they're like oh well 
you've been ready before. Right. You know, and that's unfortunate. That is not at all the way we advertise to support um, victims and survivors, but it happens. Right. It's a reality. It's unfortunate because it, it's how people slip through the cracks and yes. how people stay in abusive relationships for 20 years or become a victim of domestic homicide. Yes. Um, if, is there an, a, like a technical definition for domestic homicide? That's or is it what it's called? It's just you. Domestic work. violence or homicide by domestic violence, sometimes they'll say. But Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it is what it sounds like. It's being, you know, murdered by your partner because they abused you. So I took some time and just looked up. These are national statistics. One in three female murder victims and one in 20 male murder victims are killed by intimate partners. Wow. Um, A study of intimate partner homicides found 20% of victims were family members or friends of the abused partner, neighbors, Persons who intervened, law enforcement responders, or bystanders. That's some steep numbers That's to me. That's wild. Yeah. 72% of all murder suicides are perpetrated by intimate partners. Um, and 94% of murder suicide victims are female. Mm. Do you know off the top of your head the statistic about pregnant women? How the leading cause of death for pregnant women is domestic homicide, I believe. I don't know that. I don't know that, but I do know that your it's like it doubles or triples right um, your chance of being abused. But if you're already being abused, yeah, you're right. It the chances increase significantly for homicide. Yeah, I knew. I just that I heard that statistic one time, and I was like whoa like that shouldn't be a thing right um but unfortunately you know as sad as that is pets also yeah tend to be victims of this stuff too i mean it's so sad one of uh what i always think of is we bring this display to kutztown called the silent witness display every year typically it is during october since october is domestic violence awareness month um it is these red silhouettes about you know of life, their life-sized silhouettes of victims of domestic homicide, and this, the actual display includes pets that were also victims too, and it's really, really sad. It's really sad. Some of the stories for the pets is just like hurts. Yes, it is very sad. So this is our 18th annual year. Um, the witnesses are coming to Kutztown. Um, as Trisha shared, they are life-size silhouettes and they wear a shield on their breast that shares their story Um, I can share with you that there are five new shields um, coming with this year's display so they and they all represent people who have passed away or died in Berks County so that's pretty staggering it's very upsetting. Um, we hold the display in the Old Main Concourse. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's literally just the lobby of, of Old Main. Um, and we always put out a book for people to sign and like kind of you know leave their thoughts and things like that in regards to the display. If you've never seen it or if, you, or if you've seen it but just never taken the time to look at it, definitely take the time to look at it. It's a really moving display and it really kind of reminds you that not everyone is fortunate fortunate enough to leave these situations and that sometimes it's just a little too late um it's very sobering yeah it's very sobering i it just i don't i just lost my train of thought um the display sorry uh the display will be uh in the old main concourse from november 4th to the 8th it's always up for a week long and like i said it's in the old main lobby or the old main concourse and things like that um i hope we touched on a lot of different topics for people that are tuning in or listening to this one today i hope that we provided some you know some good history um some statistics some how you know signs of an unhealthy relationship if you're interested in any of the resources or any of the like information that we actually provided today, please feel free to stop in at the Women's Center. I have copies of the 10 signs of an unhealthy relationship um, and how to help a friend as well. 
And that we have a, just we have a bunch of other resources as well that you know I create. We have pamphlets for safe Berks and I'm um, on campus Mondays two to four thirty and Thursdays ten to two. Stop in and see me. You do not need an appointment. You can just stop by the office and and chat. Yes. And I also have business cards for Stacy for Stacy too. So if you do come in on like a Tuesday and she's not there, I can give you her business card um, and you can get a hold of her. Um, I just want to plug also, I think it's important for students to know when I say I'm a confidential mm, person on yes. campus, that literally means confidential. That means whatever we talk about will not leave the office. I do not make any kind of reports or, um, you know, provide information to administrators other college personnel like what we talk about stays in that office yes it's important to make that note because all of KU faculty and staff are mandated reporters right. and that means that they if they learn about abuse that is happening or sexual violence that is happening they have to report to public safety and to uh, Jesus Pena which is our title IX coordinator um, I'm lucky that in my position at the Women's Center as the graduate assistant I have what is called limited confidentiality, and that is where, you know, I still have to make that report. So if you come in and you're like, I'm in an abusive relationship and I was sexually assaulted, I have to still report to public safety and Jesus, but I don't have to include your name, which is, you know, sometimes it's still scary to know that that report's going to be made, but it's still safe enough that you're not going to be contacted by those offices and things like that. Um, but Stacy is 100% confidential because she's not a paid employee through us. She's grant funded through Safe Berks. Um, so she doesn't have those reporting obligations. And it is important to know where you can report or, you know, who is a mandated reporter on campus because, you know, you know, sometimes it is a safety factor being able to come in and talk about things. It's also important to know that it's confidential because you are not alone Right. And you should always know that there are resources and people on our campus that want to, you know, help you and want to hear your story and want to, you know, help you get through whatever you're experiencing. So and if I don't know if I mentioned this before, but the Women's Center is located in Old Main. It is Old Main 126. Um, and you can find me there for tw about 20 hours a week. And then you'll find Stacy there on Mondays and Thursdays. And she has just been absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um before I wrap up, I'm going to plug some events that are going on for the Women's Center and the GLBTQ Resource Center. Um, like I said, the Silent Witness display will be coming in November. That's, you know, a little bit away. Uh, in terms of other events, though, another really good event, if you want to know more or just be able to learn kind of even more how to spot an unhealthy relationship, there is a workshop called the Escalation Workshop. It, we will be holding it at the MCC or the Multicultural Center. It will. It is going to be next Tuesday, October 8th from 5 to 6.30. It is a 45-minute film that kind of takes you through the escalation of an unhealthy relationship. And then there's discussion that follows about it. It's a really good workshop. And then we have our coming out day on Thursday, October 10th from 11 to 2. It's going to be the Allies Awareness Fair. That's going to be the Old Main Concourse. That'll be super cool. Uh, we have an event called the Courage Factor by Awe. That's happening on October 17th. That is um, going to be a really cool event, too, because it's going to be women, these professional women that kind of come together and provide this panel about, you know, just the resources or the things that you need in terms of, you know, how to be professional or how to, like, navigate those areas that maybe you don't have a lot of knowledge on how to navigate things like that and then we also have the mask you live in screening on tuesday october 22nd from 5 30 to 9 that will be an msu 183 in the alumni auditorium and that'll be super cool that's a great one to learn more about toxic masculinity and just kind of you know the uh i guess uprising like the how boys are raised in this society and how that can actually really affect them and how they're not really allowed to just be a human being so yeah if you're interested in getting involved show up come out and support our events um and so i'm really happy that y'all have listened and tuned in today uh you listen to tough topics with trisha and stacy about domestic violence and we'll see you next time which is going to be on november 7th Thank you.